So I'd like to officially welcome everybody to the last webinar of our spring webinar series. My name is Amanda and I am the coordinator of the Manitoba IBA program. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are joining this webinar from across the province of Manitoba in the territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Oti Cree nations, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The Nature Manitoba office sits on Treaty 1 territory and the traditional homeland um, of the Métis Nation. All of these people have been strong caretakers of the land since time immemorial and continue to be strong caretakers today and into the future. So today we have Christian Artuso joining us for um, identification of Manitoba shorebirds. Uh, Christian is a dedicated ornithologist and conservationist with many years of experience working um, with our local birds in Manitoba. His PhD work examined the human density on eastern screech owls, and he is currently a wildlife biologist with the Canadian Wildlife Service in Ottawa. His passion for citizen science, ornithology, and conservation has led to his involvement in setting up the International Shorebird Survey in Manitoba, coordinating our breeding bird atlas. Um, and Christian has been a member of the Manitoba Important Bird Area Steering Committee since its inception, along with many other conservation and outreach initiatives. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Christian to get started. Thanks very much, Amanda. And I just want to say right off the bat, jump in with your questions at any time. I'll try to keep one eye on the chat. Amanda, if you see something I don't, just um, let's just make this as, as conversational as you, as you like. Don't feel you have to hold your questions to the end. There's actually a lot of material and it's a little bit of a rush. So it, it's just better if you fire your questions as you think of them. And uh, and then that'll be a signal to me to speed up or slow down. I got uh, someone off mute for just a second there. So, Okay, so hopefully you can see that. A little bit of background. I will, I will rush through this material because of time, but I'd, I'd like to give you a little bit of a, a sense of uh, the big global picture. That's just kind of my nature of things. So... Worldwide, not in Manitoba, but worldwide, there are over 200 species of the things we call shorebirds. And they actually come from 14 different families. They're all the, the Charadriforms, the ones that don't have webbed feet. Like the gulls are in this order, but nobody considers a gull to be a shorebird. The ones we know best are the plovers and the sandpipers and also the avocets. There are a few more. Uh, the thickneys, if you've been down to sort of a bit more tropical locations, you might have seen a thickney. They're actually a nocturnal shorebird. This, this one is a three-striped thickney from Mexico. The, if you've been to the west coast of Canada, you might have seen the, this member of the oyster catcher family, uh, but they're long bills that gives them their name for opening oysters. This is the black oyster culture in the west coast near Vancouver. There's another species called American oyster catcher that sometimes comes into eastern Canada. Uh, then there's some really unique families. This is the Egyptian plover, a family of just one species, famously known as the crocodile bird, written about by Herodotus. Herodotus said, uh, that this bird picks the teeth clean of the Nile crocodile, which is not true, but that never stopped Herodotus. Uh, then the then the Jasanas. Some people will pronounce that word Jacana because it's spelled J-A-C-A-N-A, -A -A, but it should be pronounced Jasana. It's a Cicidia, and it's a Portuguese. Well, it comes to English from Portuguese, but it's an indigenous word. Uh, the just the the Jasanas are, are um, really interesting shorebirds. They look a bit more like a rail, but they're a shorebird, and they're actually also polyandrous, uh, meaning that females have multiple male partners, and the males do most of the work of incubating and brooding. And we'll talk about that a little bit in others. Seed snipe, another example of a unique shorebird family. This one from the Andes, Rufus-bellied seed snipe. 
Button quail, believe it or not, are actually shorebirds, uh, and so on. And with the, with the name of shorebird, you might think that they're going to occur in shorelines, but actually, shorebirds occur in a lot of different habitats. So there are quite a few grassland shorebirds, like this upland sandpiper that you can see here. I am uh, I'm moving my cursor in a circle. I'm not sure if folks can see that or not. I hope so. Uh, some some are on quite rocky coastlines, like these purple sandpipers here. Some nest in forested habitats, like this is a this is a greater yellow legs perched on top of a tree here. In addition to the what we expect shorebirds to do, which is hang out in shallow water. And shorebirds are just some of the most exceptionally long distance migrants in the bird world. They are, some of them are simply astonishing. So these, what you see here are the tracks of bar-tailed godwits going from Alaska to New Zealand. So a shorebird that thinks nothing of just crossing the Pacific Ocean. And believe me, there's not too many places in the Pacific Ocean to to stop. Actually, they've now the this species has been recorded with flapping non-stop flapping flight of seven, eight, and even nine days, nine days straight without stopping. And that's not uh, gliding or soaring like a hawk. That's actually flapping flight. So it's astonishing. And then this is the. This over here is a red knot, and this is a track of their migration, or at least some populations of the red knot go down to Tierra del Fuego and back again. So there's a famous individual, um, there's a famous individual red knot called B9 that has traveled more than the distance from Earth to the moon already, just by flying back and forth every year. So for a size range, the smallest in the world is the least sandpiper. If you ever see least sandpiper on a mud flat with something like a white-throated sparrow, they're about the same size. <laughs> they're really tiny. And generally in North America, we call the tiny ones the peeps. If so if you hear the word peep used in terms of birds, it's referring to these small shorebirds like the least sandpiper. Uh, here photographed on its nesting grounds in northern Manitoba, but they're common through southern Manitoba migration. The largest ones are the curlews, in particular the far eastern curlew, which is about uh, 860 grams or 63 centimeters from tip of the bill to tip of the tail. So that's sort of a range in size. And just a couple of really cool facts about shorebirds. One of the interesting things is that most of these families have fixed clutch size. They always lay four eggs. If you see anything else, something's happened. So either the nest is not complete yet, or the, next, the nest is being depredated in some way. Um, but they always lay four. They have some really interesting uh, behaviors in terms of reproduction, including quite a few polyandrous species. I mentioned that in terms of the Usanas, but the the one a Manitoba example is are the phalaropes, and this is a redneck phalarope. This is a female redneck phalarope, and she is more colorful than her male partner, and he does more of the work in terms of rearing the young, and that's also true for spotted sandpiper, also a polyandrous species. Okay, so. In general, in general terms, most of the shorebirds have tactile bills. You might think these are pectoral sandpipers and you might say to yourself, well, isn't the bill supposed to curl downward on the pectoral like you see in the back? But actually, just to illustrate how tactile uh, and how flexible shorebird bills are, I use this photo because you can actually see that the tip of the bill is capable of bending upward in this photo. So they can, they sensory, they can feel in the mud and capture things like polychaete worms that they can't actually see. 
And they have lots of fascinating behaviors too, if you get to watch them. I love watching shorebirds for their behaviors. So, so pulling up worms, bathing, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of, lots of great fun watching them. And you probably know what this behavior is. Anyone wanna anyone wanna wanna get wanna give it a guess what this what this killdeer is doing? The broken wing display is the is the common term for this one, and it's it's basically pretending to be injured. Its nest is nearby. I've come walking along this dirt road or this path. It's like it's trying to lead me away from either its nest or babies by pretending to have a broken wing. And the killdeer are famous for this. And that actually, I find that red rump of theirs really shows up when they when they um, display like this. So the broken wing display, famous birds like lapwing, another shorebird, get their name from it. It's very well known in a bunch of species such as the killdeer. All right, and all right. So we'll start with the plover family. General principle: I'm going to work through the Manitoba birds. I'll focus on the species that are reasonably regular. And in general, I'll start with the plovers and then I'll do the sandpipers. And I'm gonna start big and work my way to the smaller ones. So if you think the small ones are too hard to identify, then you should ask a lot of questions and we won't have time <laughs> to, to get there. But uh, this is, uh, the plover family is much smaller. There's only a few, so they're a little bit easy. And what characterizes them is relatively short bills and generally speaking, fairly large eyes. Uh, and they are visual hunters. So. What this killdeer has done, the killdeer is of course in the plover family, is capture a cricket, as you can see. And it's done that by plucking it at the surface, probably on the ground or in the grass. Uh, so they're quite visual hunters and they use their short bills to grab things. Uh, we'll compare that later with the sandpipers that have long bills, which tend to, generally speaking, for probing. Here is our largest plover. This one is known as the black-bellied plover. At least that's how it's known uh, in North America. If, if you uh, learned this bird in, in Europe, you may know it as the gray plover. Um, personally, I think the name black-bellied plover is not that great because several species have black bellies. And I think the name gray plover is just not not fitting for such a wonderful bird. So I like to call them platinum plovers or silver plovers. Nobody has taken me up on that yet. So the, the black-bellied plover has a very silver plumage, as you can see from its back. It's a very large size, the silver contrasting with the black belly. They nest way up in the Arctic. So you'll only see them in Southern Manitoba during migration either spring or fall, um, often on sandy beaches on the big lakes, but also sometimes in other places like mudflats and even in farmer's fields. Sometimes you'll see them in the fields, for example, around Oak Hammock. Um, and if you do see them, it's usually worth checking for other species that might be with them. Because they're so big, they're often the first bird that you see. Uh, and so, Sometimes they hide other tricky ones like buff-breasted sandpipers in their, in their flocks. So that is the, the black-bellied plover. The only one that you will um, confuse it with perhaps is this bird. This is the American golden plover. Uh, the American golden plover, I'm just gonna go for, backward and forward so you can compare silver on the black-bellied versus a more golden color. On the, on the American golden plover. Uh, it's not necessarily as gold as all that, but it's, it's a different coloration to the, to the black belly plover. It's a, this one is a bit smaller and a bit daintier and it has a longer, finer bill. So I just wanted to compare the robustness of the bill with this one. And the reason I'm gonna do that is just to show you like it's a useful tip when it comes to the fall when you get 
plovers in these non-breeding plumages. So here is your black-bellied plover in non-breeding plumage. Here is your golden plover in, in uh, non-breeding plumage. And here is a comparison of their bills. So for today's talk, I don't want to focus on the non-breeding plumages. I'm going to focus on spring. And because it, it's May, technically it's May at least. Uh, so we'll focus on the breeding plumages that you see in May. But just to illustrate to you the, the difference in the bill size and this more robust shape of the black-bellied plover is that it's also a useful mark uh, to learn and recognize. And there's one more giveaway. This is an American golden plover here, which is, uh, I guess it'll be on the left of your screen as you look at it. Um, and this is a black bellied plover here. And one of the, one difference when they open their wings is that the black bellied plover has these dark armpits. And that's a really good mark. So if you compare that dark armpit versus the white armpit of the golden plover or grayish, then that's another field mark. If you're ever in doubt with those two species, you can wait for them to raise their wings and look for that. Christian, can I ask you a question? Sure, jump in. Um, you know the black on the belly, mm -hmm. um, in the in the black belly plover. Yeah. And so in the yeah breeding. Mm -hmm. So in the golden plover, see it's white. Um, right. In the vent. Um. In the golden There's, plover, does it go further back? Is that diagnostic or helpful? But it is quite white on the on the black bellied, and it is quite mottly dark on the the golden. So it is a. But I would say that it's not as an obvious a feature as the silver of the back and the thickness of the bill. Does the black uh, underarm does it uh, only for the breeding? Or no. Not? No, you can probably see this is a non-breeding bird here. This is a fall or winter photograph. So it's there all the time. It's good in any plumage. It's even good in juveniles. Uh, so that's a, that's a great question because sometimes you have you learn these things and then you got to remember it only applies at certain times of year or in one sex or the other sex or one plumage or the other plumage. For that, but that mark on this species is good. If you see it, you know. <laughs> um, unless you, unless it's a prairie falcon and you're really off base, you know <laughs> it's a black belly plum. So cool. Keep coming with the questions, folks. That that'll make sure that I that I don't gloss over things. So the killdeer actually technically is larger than the golden plover. So I went slightly out of order, but. But I did that, of course, because I wanted to pair, compare the black belly plover and the killdeer. So I'm breaking my own rules a little bit. But the next one is the killdeer. And I think, well, I think you all know the killdeer. I mean, if anything, the double, the double breast band is so obvious. And the beautiful face pattern, I think, is also very obvious on the killdeer. So it's a rich brown back as well. It's a large plover. It nests in all sorts of areas like grasslands and parking lots. They love parking lots. Um, because like many other shorebirds, their strategy is to just basically make a scrape on the ground. Their nests are very look like rocks, look like pebbles. They, that camouflage means that they can hide their eggs in a big parking lot and nobody's going to realize that they kill their eggs in the middle of it. So they are... Um, I think we don't need to spend too much time on the killdeer because I think they are so distinctive. But then we got a couple of little guys. The two little plovers are the semi-palmated. We'll start with the semi-palmated. Uh, this is it here. The, uh, the semi-palmated nests in northern Manitoba, but it does migrate through southern Manitoba. So the... Uh, I should have mentioned that for all of them. The black-bellied is only only in migration, and the semi-palmated plover you'll only see in southern Manitoba in migration. The killdeer you'll see nesting, and the 
the golden plover you'll see nesting in Churchill in the far north, but not in the south. So the semi-palmated plover has a brown back like a killdeer, but only a single uh, breast band, not one, not two. It's much smaller. And in breeding plumage, the orange base of the bill. And I find this head pattern quite distinctive too. I refer to it as a bridal. I, I think some people don't like that, but um, I, I, maybe that description doesn't work for you, but it's a very obvious dark line, just along basically through the underside of the eye and then up over the top of the crown. So that's the semi palmated plover. If you see them in the fall, they still have some of that, but it starts to fade away. But they still maintain these orange legs and the orange base of the bill. So uh, this is the rare one, and it's about the same size as a semi-palmated plover, but much, much paler in color, much sandier in color. Um, I didn't. I decided not to uh, put the names of the species so people have an opportunity to make a mental guess in their head first. You can shout it out if you want, or you can just guess mentally. But gold star if you know that this is a piping plover, um, and extra gold stars if you know how to separate it from the semi palmated. So I'm just going to do that trick of going backwards. Excuse me again. So notice that really patterned face and notice how that line comes in front of the eye. And now look at the piping plover with that paler face. And it has a black line above, but not in front of the eye. And then it has that much sandier coloration. Uh, it, like the, it also has just one, one breast bar. Piping plover is very rare in Manitoba. We only, these days, we only have a couple of pairs, if any, depending on the water levels, depending on the given year. That's kind of a long story, so I won't go into why so much, but it, it's a really rare bird. And if you do find these, make sure, like, take a good hard look, make sure it's not one of the other birds, like a semi pomaded if you're absolutely sure you've got a piping plover, then you should contact Amanda because we normally like to try to protect them. They're very, they do nest in Southern Manitoba, but they're very vulnerable to dogs and ATVs and the like. So if they're nesting somewhere, we try to sort of try to do a little guardian work with them. So they're sensitive that way. And they are listed in, in the, under the Species at Risk Act as endangered. So this, is, this one is listed both in the Manitoba legislation and the federal legislation. So here's what they look like when they're nesting their little chicks. You can probably see a couple of fluff balls hiding underneath uh, dad, I think, dad or mom, and, uh, and then uh, a chick here. They, they like to nest on wide sandy or gravel beaches or gravelly area and there are a few photos of the young ones but i won't focus on that today so that completes our plovers five plovers black bellied american golden killdeer semi palmated and piping plover so the next family i want to deal with is the avocets and stilts they're quite different from the plovers because they have very long bills and they also have ridiculously long legs, uh, hence the name stilt. And of course, you all know what stilt means in terms of a bird and in terms of the non-bird meaning of that word. Um, they're really the only, the only common member of this family in Manitoba is the American avocet. And the American avocet is so easy to identify with its bluish legs, its peachy colored neck, and its upturned bill and general black and white pattern and that really thin shape so it's pretty it's pretty easy they do lose the rusty peachy neck in non-breeding plumage but they're still easy to identify uh, they do you sometimes see them in the halfway house when they're starting to lose their pink or some birds do and some birds don't or some are halfway here or halfway there 
But there, there is another member of this family that's quite rare in Manitoba. And that's the black neck stilt. So you can identify a black neck stilt by the long, thin bubblegum pink legs and the black and white pattern with a basically a straight bill. Like you can tell it's kind of long and thin like an avocet, but it doesn't turn up like an avocet. But it's it's in the same family as an avocet. And because those leg, legs are so long, when they're in shallow water, they really look kind of a little bit comical, bending down like you see here. We, we sometimes get a few of pairs nesting in Southwest Manitoba, Whitewater Lake being in particular the the best area for this bird, but they're not there every year. So this is not one. Uh, this is not one you should expect. Um, and but if you do see one, it's quite easy to identify. So I thought it was worth mentioning. All right. So next, next we move on to the sandpiper family, and um, I uh, again I should have probably should have put the the names up but i wanted to give you a few seconds just to go in your head mentally what the what the bird is identify it so we'll start with our largest and work towards our smallest sandpiper and we've got a lot of ground to cover so um, if it's a bit quick i apologize but if you've got questions just chime in and we'll we'll make sure we'll make sure they get covered Okay, so the largest is the marbled godwits on this family. Um, so we're going to start with the godwits, and there are two godwit species. So we'll start with the big guy. Uh, this is the marbled godwit. And I think it gets the name marbled godwit from this beautiful, intricate marbling pattern that you see on the bird. Quite delicate and quite rich. Um, so Godwits have bills that turn upward, like an avocet, but they're much more robust bills. And the other thing about their bills is they are two-colored or bicolored. They the base is a sort of an orangey pink, and the 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 tip or the distal half is dark, almost black. So a slight upturn to the bill and a two colors on the bill, and you've got yourself a godwit. And they're also quite large shorebirds, and they really probe in the mud with that, with that uh, bill. And then if you see a general brown coloration like this, then you've got yourself a marbled godwit. It's quite buffy. Uh, I can't remember if I included it on the in a future slide or not. There's another feature of this bird is that when they lift their wings, that's quite a cinnamon under under wing as well. And I can't remember if I remembered to include a photo or not. So I'm just going to mention that now in case I forget. The other godwit is the Hudsonian godwit. The Hudsonian godwit is a little bit small. It's still a big shorebird, but it's a smaller than the marble. Uh, it's much more of a brick red color underneath. So again, I'll just go backwards. You can compare the buffy marbled and the reddish Hudsonian. So, and I should have mentioned the marbled godwit nests in southern Manitoba in grassland areas. The Hudsonian godwit nests in northern Manitoba on the tundra, basically, or the tree line. And uh, so you see this this bird you'll see in migration only in the south, unless you're in Churchill or somewhere like that. So it also has the bill of a godwit. The same, remember the two points, turns up a little bit and is two colors. But this, this bill is a little bit finer than, uh, this bill is a little bit finer than the marbles. Can you see that really? hefty bill versus the Hudson. And just in case you're wondering, sometimes in spring, you actually see the Hudsonians come through in a little bit of transitional plumage, or there is, a, there is actually a bit of difference male to female as well. So it may not be fully brick red underneath. It may, it may have a, 
a little bit of red underneath, but it's still a uh, Hudsonian Godwit field mark. I just want to use it to illustrate another point about the Hudsonian Godwit is that they actually have this very obvious wing pattern. So again, if you were ever uncertain about a marbled Godwit versus a Hudsonian, wait for them to lift their wings. If you see a black and white stripe like this, then you know you've got yourself a uh, Hudsonian. If you see cinnamon underwings, you know you've got yourself a marble. So these are these are the Hudsonians, and you can see them in flight here with their black and white here on the upper wing, and you can see their pattern on the underwing on this bird and this bird as well. And so we'll we'll come back to that image. Similar size is our wimbrel. Our wimbrel is one of the curlews, and the curlews have a bill that curves downward. Um, wimbrel is not that easy to see in southern Manitoba, but they do nest in the Hudson Bay area. So uh, this is a good shorebird to find. You can see them. Sometimes you'll see them on the beaches. Sometimes you see them at places like Whitewater Lake. Um, but uh, they're, they're hard to find. But if you see a large shorebird with a downward curving bill, it's always worth double checking. And um, sometimes the, you, a flight view of a godwit, you might not realize that the bill curves up. So it's worth also noting that the bill is dark. So dark bill and down curving on a large brown shorebird and you've got yourself a wimbrel. Also these head stripes, they're reasonably distinctive, reasonably because if you're, if it's backlit or something like that, you may, may not be able to see them, but normal in good light, the head pattern with these stripes is quite distinctive and this very brown cryptic plumage also the next one is the willet this is a non-breeding bird the breeding bird is a bit more stripey below and a bit more pattern below but the main identification feature of a willet is the bill is dark and straight so let's just go a little bit backwards here just to get just to get a summary going two godwits bicolored bill turning up large one is marbled slightly smaller is Hudsonian Godwit. Next is the downward curving large, large shorebird is the wimbrel. And now straight bill, black bill is, and a gray plumage is the willet. And the, this one, this bird is in more breeding plumage. You can see it has more markings on it in breeding plumage, but it still gives the impression of a very generally uh, gray shorebird until this happens, until they fly. <laughs> when the willet opens their wings, the gray shorebird transforms into a black and white thing of great beauty. They really, they, they can fly above the grasslands or the flats and they suddenly it's like wow what is that thing so they have a really obvious black and white striped wing and just to compare because i did mention the wing of the hudsonian godwit so here i've put the hudsonian godwit photo that i showed you earlier against the willet so you can see that difference perhaps the willet has a really really thick white outer band and a really thick white underwing band. It's not, um, it's not, it's not as thick on the, the, the Hudsonian Godwit as you can see here. And here. So it's, um, and, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be too likely to confuse the two anyway, but they both, they're, they're the two species with this black and white striped wings. But obviously the Hudsonian Godwit has the red belly. It's got the upturned bill versus the straight bill. Uh, and uh, that black, black and white rump, I actually didn't mention that, the tail pattern as well. And there's, a, there's the photo that I should have started with. That's a willet in breeding plumage. Um, so what, it's the same grayish overall, 
dark straight bill but it has more of this scalloping barring pattern in them, this influence. And as you can see from this photo, they'll nest in grasslands as well as on large gravel flats. So you can get them even in pastures. This bird is standing on a fence post in a pasture. Okay. So then, and similar sort of size to the willet is the greater yellow legs. Now we have two, we have, uh, two yellow leg species. Um, the yellow legs is quite yellow, like it's quite obvious. So usually I find most people don't have problems knowing that they're looking at a yellow legs. However, <laughs> they may have problems knowing which yellow legs. So that is uh, that is worth talking about. But the yellow the yellow legs are pretty distinctive. The bill on the grater has a very subtle upturn and the bill base is usually quite pale. So notice how it's sort of that yellowish green at the base of the bill. Notice how the bill turns up and notice how the bill is quite thick. And then here's one, here's one uh, in, the, in the water, the legs are almost hidden but you can still see the pale base to the bill becoming darker at the tip and the slight upturn. So you know you've got a grater. Here's one in flight. Uh, sometimes when you see birds in flight, it's not so clear what their bill shape is. So I, you might think that this bird has a straight bill. So I just wanted to use that to illustrate. It can be a bit tricky. You might remember my very opening slides and the pectoral sandpiper with the bill curly up. So I just like to mention that uh, sometimes, but when they're at rest at perch, they will look like that. And then you want to compare that with the lesser yellow legs, which has usually a dark bill, a finer, more needle-like bill, smaller size, which is very obvious if you see them together. Uh, and really a quite fine, quite pointy bill. Uh, like a lot of shorebirds, they'll actually call from the trees when they're nesting. So th this is a bit of a comparison that I sometimes use with the ratio. So usually lesser on top is dark versus greater on the bottom is pale at the base. And people say the ratio of 1.3 or less is lesser and 1.6 or great or more is greater that's probably not that uh it's probably not that useful to you but um but you can see uh you can sort of compare the greater here with its thicker bill and larger size versus the lessers and uh, please ignore the dowager in the middle temporarily we'll talk about dowagers in a minute Okay, uh, coming down slightly in size is the upland sandpiper. It's a bit of a weird one. It looks quite comical. It nests in grasslands, as you can see here. It's got like a very small head, and so the eye looks quite large in the head. And the bill is, for a sandpiper, it's quite short. Actually, in the old days, people called them upland plovers because the bill is short, so that sort of felt it belonged to the plovers, but actually it belongs to the sandpiper family. So it's called upland sandpiper. The easiest way to identify these is by their call, the wolf whistle, but, or by habitat, you'll see them standing on wires and fence posts in grasslands. So if you need to remember them, the yellow legs, a straight bill or almost straight, and usually with a, a pale coloration along the lower and the side of the upper mandible, which becomes dark at the tip, and it's actually dark along the top. So if the bird, uh, if the bird put its head down, it might look dark, but if the bird turned its bill sideways, the bill would look quite yellow. And I don't know if this is large enough on your screen to see that, but it would look dark 
along the top and at the tip, and then it looks quite yellow on the side of the bill. And this, this is just a postural thing here. Like this, oops, sorry. This bird has its neck up. This bird has its neck hunched in. So just a postural, a postural difference there for you. So straight bill, yellow on the along and side, but black at the tip. And habitat, you've got yourself an upland sampler. Now it starts to get a bit trickier. So, so do feel free to chime in with questions and we'll try to do, we can do comparisons or the like if needed. So um, we have two dowager species and they're really, they're really quite tricky to, um, to identify. So uh, the main thing I wanna focus, focus on is the depth, what constitutes a dowager. So they have these yellowish, greenish yellowish legs and they have the straight bill and they feed by probing very up and down like a sewing machine and that makes a dowager. Now this is the short billed dowager and I would say the short billed dowager is the more common of the two, but um, so we'll start with it. Uh, so a dark straight bill, uh, when they feed, you'll see a probing action. So I'll just show you temporarily that. And when they fly, you'll see this white cigar up the back of the bird. So this this white cigar mark is quite um, is quite distinctive and quite useful. So a yellow, a yellow legs would look white on the rump and then it would have the black and white on the tail, but it would not have this white mark up the back. Okay, so um, now getting slightly smaller, we move to the solitary sandpiper. There are two of this small size that I think you should focus on, solitary and spotted. And the solitary, has a very prominent white eye ring. That is a, a very obvious feature to it. It's got a straight bill. It's got greenish yellow legs and it's got this grayish coloration with white spots on the back. So these are also solitary sandpipers. They look a bit like a yellow legs. Some people would confuse them with the yellow legs. So there's a lesser yellow legs and they're not, uh, they're much, the, the lesser yellow legs is only slightly larger than a solitary sandpiper. The greater yellow legs is much larger. So I just want you to compare the real yellow of a yellow legs versus the greenish yellow of this bird, uh, the solitary sandpiper. And I hope you can see it in that photo as well. So be a little careful of yellow legs, but hopefully you should, uh, you should be able to distinguish them and they have more spotty back pattern as well. And sometimes the spotted sandpiper will confuse people uh, because they think that the solitary sandpiper has spots on the back, therefore it should be spotted sandpiper. But actually the spotted sandpiper is this bird and the spots are on the underside. And this, the, it's really the only one of our shorebirds that has spots on the underside, although it only has them at this, at this time of year. So um, don't, uh, don't treat that as diagnostic at other times of years. Remember that at, uh, at this time of year uh, in breeding plumage. The spots on the underside is such a giveaway. The orange bill with a black tip is also a useful feature. The small size, and it's got some other behavioral things like it wags its tail a bit. It, uh, sorry, bobs its tail would be a correct word. It bobs its tail up and down a bit when it walks. And it's, um, it's a bird you'll find in rivers along river banks. Like I used to see them along the Assiniboine River all the time, for example. So it is quite common uh, and it's in some different habitats. It's in some more riparian -y 
type habitats as well. So you, you may, you sometimes see it on the mud site with the other shorebirds, but not necessarily. So I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to skip over the, the non-breeding plumages. In flight, it has this distinctive stripe on the wing and a very distinctive flight style, kind of flapping underneath its body like that. So it can, uh, you can sort of learn its behavior. You might, uh, you might learn to recognize it very quickly from behavior alone. So for the sake of inclusion, the woodcock is also a shorebird. It's in the sandpiper family. You might not think of it as a shorebird because it lives in the forest, but technically it is a shorebird and it's a nocturnal or crepuscular shorebird to be more correct. So you can see it's large eyes. Uh, it doesn't behave like other shorebirds. You won't see it on the mudflats. Uh, and if you see it in the daytime at all, you're a little bit lucky. But uh, just for inclusion, here's, here's our woodcock. Its pattern on the top of its head is so distinctive. It's kind of bold, thick black stripes with orange thin stripes. So distinctive, it's long straight bill, the salmony colored underparts and this glorious cryptic pattern on the back that enables it to blend in. So that's, that's the woodcock, which is pretty unmistakable, but pretty hard to see. Snipe is also, of course, in this family. So this is our Wilson snipe. Uh, generally speaking, I think people can identify snipe pretty readily, although sometimes people mix it up. It's much browner than a yellow leg, so it's quite a brown bird. It's quite cryptically patterned. It has these stripes on the head. You might remember I talked about the wimbrel as having stripes on the head, but the with the wimbrel is not as many or not as striped as the snipe. And of course the snipe has that long straight bill, which is kind of synonymous, you know, with the bird and with things like sniping and sniper and so on. So the, the long straight bill is kind of part and parcel of, of being a snipe, I guess. And so that very brown and very cryptic pattern and snipe is a bird of all habitats. Like you'll see them in forests. You'll see them sometimes in shorelines too. Um, you'll see them sitting up on trees like this bird with doing kick, kick, kick call. And of course they display in the air like woodcocks do. Uh, uh, in the case of the woodcock, in the case of, sorry, I'll go. In the case of the woodcock, it does a flight display that uh, uses specially modified primaries to make a sound like doo, 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 doo. In the case of the snipe, it uses these specially modified tail feathers that rattle when it, that vibrate when it flies and it makes that winnowing sound. So the, the, it uses specially modified tail feathers to display. So this is a, this is a snipe. You can see the head pattern really stripy. And I thought I would show you the underwing because the underwing of this bird is actually quite quite beautiful and quite distinctive. It's weird because the bird looks very brown or even reddish brown and then it opens up its wings and suddenly it looks black and white. But it's a, an exceptionally beautiful bird this night. Most people don't, um, don't have too much problem identifying our, our Wilson snipe. If you have a very old field guide, it might be down as common snipe. Um, nowadays, that common snipe and the Wilson snipe have been split. So the common snipe is a Eurasian species, and the Wilson snipe is a North American species. Uh, I thought I mentioned that because every so often I get a question about common snipe. Okay, so now we're moving into the smaller ones, and they're they, this does start to get a bit tricky, although in May it's a much easier. So these are the red knots. The red knots have this, I would say it's a unique color. Now, we've seen red shorebirds already, like we've seen the red of the Hudsonian godwit, for example. But I don't know, this salmony red color of the red knot, in my opinion, is quite distinctive. Red knots are a very compact, chunky shorebird. 
they have a beautifully intricate pattern on their back. Uh, and they have a dark straight bill and dark legs. And then, so this is their, this is what they, they look like in spring. They're hard to see. This is another one that is um, listed under the Federal Species at Risk Act as endangered. So this is another endangered species. They're not that common in Southern Manitoba, but you can see them in spring in the wetlands. You can also see them on the big lakes, like on the beaches around Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg. Um, it's turning out that with all the work that the IBA program is doing that Riverton Sandy Bar seems to be one of the best places to see in Manitoba. But you can see them elsewhere. I've seen them at Whitewater Lake or along the shoreline of Lake Winnipeg as well. I, in this plumage, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be too hard. Um, so we'll just leave it at that and I will gloss over the non-breeding plumage. Likewise, the ruddy turnstone in May should be quite easy. Like it's really a very distinctive pattern. The rich red of the back and then this harlequin pattern on the face, uh, the bright red legs, and then this um, dagger-like bill. So they actually, the name is quite apt. They do literally turn stones. So the, the ruddy turnstone, will use that dagger-like bill to flip flip up things and then grab a tasty morsel underneath a rock or whatever it's just flipped over. Uh, actually, the face pattern is unique and you can identify individual birds by the unique face pattern, but um, very easy if you remember that, that sort of stripy face and white and the red back, the pink legs, and if nothing else, remember that distinctive bill, which looks really quite like a dagger because then when it comes to fall and juvenile plumages, you're like, oh yeah, I recognize that bill. Okay, next we have stilt sandpiper. Stilt sandpiper is quite tricky in non-breeding plumage, but it's relatively easy in breeding plumage by the stripes on the belly. So you can see how it's all stripy down here. And then it sort of becomes a bit more speckly or streaky on the neck. Th that is very distinctive. And so it, again, at this time of year, you've got a good opportunity to learn this bird, to learn its shape. You got an easy ID because you see that right away. You say, aha, stilt sandpiper. Um, but then once you've done that, take some time to learn the bird a bit better. So learn that it has a slightly decurved bill. Learn that it has a chestnut ear cover and a chestnut cap. Uh, and learn that it has this yellow legs, but not, not as yellow as the yellow legs. So. You will see in non-breeding plumage, you'll see them with yellow legs together. Uh, at that time of year, they'll look like this. You might say that's not an easy ID, but if you've learned those features, you, you can remember that bill shape. You, the chestnut ear coverts will stick around. So you may see that even at other times of years. Okay, next in terms of size is the pectoral sandpiper. This is our pec, uh, pectoral, of course, from the pexis referring to the breast pattern. The, the most obvious thing about pex is pectoral sandpipers is the breast pattern really sharply contrasts from the belly. Like the belly is white, like really white, and the breast is really brown speckled. And there's almost like a line between the two. Um, you can see it in this next photo again, like the, there's almost a, like a line between the two. Uh, and their bill is also got a slight D curve on it, D curve, down curve, uh, but much, a lot of orange at the base becoming dark and at the tip or towards the tip. Orange legs, 
And that breast pattern and that bill pattern are the things to remember for pectoral sandpiper. And it should be reasonably obvious. Now, the one, the one thing I want to say about the pecs, though, sorry, I shouldn't use shorthand, pectoral sandpiper, is that there's a big difference in size between males and females. So be a little bit careful about size. I've, uh, I've put these in terms of decreasing size, uh, but, but there's a big difference between a male pectoral and a female pectoral. And a male looks like a much bigger bird, whereas a female, maybe you might think you're looking at one of the peeps. So I just wanna say that um, it's worth studying, it's worth studying and remembering that pattern orange legs and that breast pattern to belly and that bill with the orange base it's worth remembering those things um just and if you think if you think you're looking at a peep and it's got those features then maybe you can say oh maybe it's just a small peck a small pectoral sandpaper uh, so similar in sort of some general coloration is the buff-breasted sandpiper, but the buff-breasted sandpiper has a straight dark bill and the even buff coloration through similar sort of orangish legs, but um, quite a distinct bird. Uh, very delicate looking, very long winged looking. And the, the buff is sort of even throughout. Um, so this is... Uh, this is the buff-breasted sandpiper. This is a tricky bird to see. They're hard to see. They they blend in with fields so well, and they like they less. You're less likely to see them on a mudflat, and much more likely to see them in a pasture or a field. They're much more of a grassland bird than they are a shore bird. So remember remember that. And you remember what I said in the beginning about plovers? Remember I said black belly plovers are big and obvious and golden plovers are big. Well, in non-breeding season in particular, you can, you have, uh, you can, this is an illustration of what I meant. So there is a, this is a photo of a field in fall. There is your black bellied plover right there. That bird you can see as you're driving by. But these birds <laughs> here and here, which are these buff-breasted sandpipers here and here, the, this one corresponds to this one, this one corresponds to this one, this one corresponds to this one, and this one corresponds to this one. <laughs> that, that, they are really hard to spot in a stubble field. So buff-breasted is one that birders get quite excited about because they're, they're hard to see. So here's a buff breasted on top. Uh, I won't, I won't go into the rarities. That, if you know what the bird on the bottom is, then you're really, you're really excellent. You probably shouldn't be in this short, in this work. <laughs> I uh, have a slide here comparing the buff breasted sandpiper with the rough, and the rough is quite rare in top. Uh, so uh, I'll skip over that. I think in the interest. Okay, so now getting down to the really little guys, uh, the Sanderling. The Sanderling has a red head in breeding plumage, but, um, and it runs along the beaches usually. So usually you're gonna see it on the beaches. And that red head is quite distinctive. The thing though, is that most people don't see sanderlings with the red head. They see them at other times of years when they're this ghostly pale bird, like this juvenile or like this adult. So they, they really look ghostly pale and they run along the beaches and they're quite comical. They run so fast. They're like little wind up toys. Um, so the, the red head is very distinctive if they have it, but it's actually, it's only really in May that you're gonna see a sanderling with a red head. And usually you won't see them, um, usually you won't see them um, in the same habitat as the mud flat birds. You'll see them on the beach. So they do one, it's worth noting their, their big stripe on their wings, which is a quite obvious stripe as well, in case that's useful for you. 
and similar size to them is the Dunlin. Uh, the Dunlin is easy in spring, hard in fall. So uh, actually, it used to be called red back sandpiper because it has that red back, almost like a turnstone. Uh, but then its bill is not like a turnstone. Its bill is dark and downward curved. And uh, this is, uh, all of this is on the cheat sheet that I should have given you before. <laughs> uh, and then there's um, the other distinctive mark is this black belly spot. So if you see that red back, whitish bird with a big black splotch on its belly, and a downward curving bill, then you've got yourself a dunlin. So they're pretty, they're pretty distinctive. Here's one, here's one um, up uh, nesting grounds near near Churchill, Manitoba. So red back, black spot, black bill with a little T curve. If you're asking why that bird is called dunlin, that's because in non-breeding plumage they look quite dun colored. Uh, so I won't, I won't focus on those for now. Okay, and then we've got our phalarope species. I'm just going to focus on the two that are regular. So this is the Wilsons. The phalarope, so the female of the phalarope is more colorful than the male. So just remember female phalarope. Uh, and the, the best idea on a Wilson's phalarope, which this bird is the Wilson's one, is that they have this black stripe that becomes a chestnut stripe. You see, it starts black and then it's sort of somewhere on the neck, it changes to chestnut. They have a long, thin bill, dark legs. I, I would say they have a distinctive shape. The male, this is a male, so he's not as colorful as she is, but he, he still does have that pattern. It's just not as it's not as contrasty as her pattern. So she is very obvious with that pattern. He has a more subdued version, but he still has the same pattern. And he's, he's a bit peachier and she's got this richer coloration. Uh, and the Wilsons, the Wilsons fell up nests in Southern Manitoba in sedge meadows and the like. Compare that with the smaller redneck fell up, which nests in the North. The, the rednecks you'll only see in migration. Often you see them swimming and they're very famous for their, their swimming around in circles, making a vortex, which brings up food to the surface that they feed on. This is a female bird with the red neck, gray face, red neck. You've got a red neck phalarope, a finer bill than the Wilsons and that habitat of swimming in circles probably your, your easiest bet. I'm just going to skip through all of the other stuff. Oh boy, I'll jump to the peeps. These are not easy to do quickly, but I'll do my best. So we have four extremely difficult shorebirds to identify. They are least sandpiper, semi-palmated sandpiper, white rump sandpiper, and Baird's sandpiper. They are very tough. Uh, the least because it has yellow legs is a bit easier, but they are very tough. So this is the Baird's. Dark legs, small size, dark bill, and very pointy wings. Extre really long, thin wings that extend well beyond the tail. And you've got yourself a Baird sandpiper. The, the color is a bit more brownish than the white rumped. This is the white rumped. If you see the white rump fly, it's white rump is distinctive, but that's not always easy to see. If you see it really well, look for this pink, this little subtle pink base of the bill. And again, look for those really pointy wings. Those really pointy wings tell you you've either got a Baird's or a white rump, and they're quite small. But the two real uh, this is another this is another white rump showing that showing that pink. Uh, this was a white rump from the beginning of the presentation to show you that white rump. Uh, so you see, if it's got a full white rump across, complete white rump, that's a great field mark. If you're able to see that, you're like, uh huh. 
I've got you. All of the other peeps have this black line down the middle. So they have white on the side, but they have a black line down the middle. Um, like you, not if you're looking at the underside, but if you're looking at the top side, the, these, are, these here are least sandpipers. And you can see that black line down the middle versus the white rump, the clean white rump of the white rump sandpiper. So that is a useful feature, but it's not easy to see that. So, so be a little bit uh, cautious. There, here, there, here are bared sandpipers with showing that mark. This is semi parmated sandpiper showing that mark. This is least sandpiper that's showing that mark. The only one that shows a clean white stripe across is the white rump. So the, this is the semi-palmated sandpiper with dark legs. Notice the tail end is not as pointy. I'm just going to go back a bit, compare that with these guys. So look at that, really pointy, really pointy, really pointy. Versus semi-palmated, the wings sort of fall at the tail end. So it's a little bit pointy, but not nearly as much. It's got dark legs and tiny size. Uh, these are the a shot of the semi palmations just to show you why it gets the name semi palmated and the only thing you will compare confuse it with is the least sandpiper but the least sandpiper has yellow legs and the yellow legs are it's the only one of these four that has yellow legs so the yellow legs are very useful you might remember the pectoral i showed earlier but this bird is much smaller it has an old dark bill it doesn't have that that contrast in the breast. So it's this is the least sandpiper, quite a common bird. Again, those yellow legs and that fairly rich reddish brown color usually too. Unless you are, uh, you know, covered in mud, those yellow legs will be a useful feature for you. And this is the way I remember them. Uh, maybe this doesn't work for everybody. But I like to say there are two sizes. There's the larger ones. Large is a strong word because they're quite small. <laughs> small and long winged and tiny and short winged. But the two that are in this row are the beards and the white rumped. And the two tiny, tiny, teeny, teeny guys are the least and the semi palmated. And you might remember I said least is the smallest in the world, actually. So these two are very small and these two are very are a little bit bigger than tiny. <laughs> and then the color difference. So beards and least are a bit more on that reddish brown and white rumped and semi palmated are a bit more on that grayish brown color scale. So that's the, that's the difference. That, that's the way I like to use them when I'm first going through them. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I study those other features like looking for the pink on the base of the bill of the white rump, for example. So, I mean, I had some quizzes and things. I'm gonna skip those because of the time. And I think we'll, uh, we'll move to the very end here. Oops. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end it there. I do apologize for going long, um, but uh, that's pretty typical for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's an excuse, but it is pretty typical. That is perfectly fine, Christian. <laughs> we just, you gave us more tips and tricks yeah. than, than we could fit into the hour-long presentation. So if Christian's happy to stick around, I'm happy to stick around. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody has questions, um, if you want to unmute yourself, remember, um, you just have to press the mute or unmute the little microphone button and you should be able to talk. Thanks, thanks to everybody who said thanks in the chat. I'm just, uh, I've got a request to do a uh, long and short build voucher. But I'll take another question in the interim and then I'll do that. Christian? So, yeah, go ahead, Linda. You, do you think because there is so much water around that we're not going to see the huge concentrations of shorebirds? That they're going to be spread out all over the place? That's possible it's really hard for me to know since i'm since i'm not there right now but um yeah i realize um, that but but you know normally like normal whatever normal is but you know we have like there'll be 
ponds, yeah. but not nearly as much as what we have now. And so they've got so yeah. many places to to land. Now. The the a lot can change in just a short amount of time. And the real peak of shorebird migration is towards the end of May, like the third week. Right. It's I what I like to do is at this time of year, like early May, is sort of look around where there is a lot of standing water and make a mental note of it and then go and revisit that um, a, a couple of weeks later. Um, sometimes there can be a huge change. Like sometimes you're like, you're going with great excitement and then you get there and there's no water left. Right. Uh, yeah. Sometimes that's of course got to do with human activity as well. <laughs> sometimes there's uh, pumping and things going on, but um, it'd be a, be a bit hard to say it might actually be good like it might actually um it might actually mean that you've got some nice shorebird spots with shorebird concentrations where you can go and quietly compare the differences between multiple species that's really fun um uh that's really fun when it happens and it's um you know it's a great learning opportunity like they might not be uh, half a mile away. Sort of they, they might not be half a mile away. Every so often, for example, when they do a drawdown at the right time of year at Okamic, every once or twice when the teal cell, for example, has been drawn down at uh, at the right time of year, uh, you know, it's just amazing because you get great close views and you can have quite literally twenty or more species in the same in the same area. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's fantastic learning opportunity. So keep an eye on it, Linda, see what happens. Remember that a lot can change between then and now. Right now, you'll have your killdeers, your yellow legs, and a few others. But in a couple of weeks, you're going to have a lot more. So right. get ready. I'm just going to, I've got a question in the chat. So I'm going to share my screen one time. Somebody asked if the dowagers, uh, if the dowagers, do um, uh, mix with other species, absolutely. Sometimes they're in big flocks of their own and sometimes they are, um, and sometimes they're mixed flocks. So most of these birds can be in mixed flocks and that does include the dowager. And for the person who asked the difference between short build and long build, these are long builds here and these are short build here. So it's so easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> very this is this is high-end stuff like if you want a challenge this is high-end stuff so the like try to identify the dowager don't don't beat yourself up if you can tell something is a dowager remember that cigar stripe on the back that i mentioned remember that straight bill and the sewing machine action yay i've got a dowager that's good like don't beat yourself up is it a long build or a short build well here, if you really, if you really want a challenge, then look for, on the short build, look for the spots on the side of the breast. On the long build, it looks much more like barring on the side of the breast. So spotted versus barred. There is a subtle difference in color. I would describe short build as a bit more close to salmon and the long build as a bit more red. That's subtle. That's not easy. You maybe you don't like my adjectives. If you can pick your own adjectives, and then the back is a little bit different. So the the back, the short build has these really orangey tips and buff mixed. The long build has a lot of white, so it looks more black and white. It does have some orange, but it's got a lot of white tips. So the back with the white tips versus the orangey buff, the side spotted versus barring, and a subtle difference in color if you need to tell them apart. And those are the dowager. Dwayne, we should, um, there's, a, there's a website. Amanda, can you put that website in the chat perhaps? It's um, bandedbird.com or what? It's something like that. Uh, you can go to that website and report it. They usually want you to. Um, they usually want you to uh, read the whole number. If not, Dwayne, you can. I see you're holding up a photo. So if if you like, you can email that photo to Amanda or myself, 
Uh, Amanda can give you my email if you don't have it. And we can do our best to read the band and report it. But if you do see a shorebird with a leg band or a flag, some shorebirds have a, a colored flag on their leg, please do try to photograph it. We had a super exciting case of a red knot that our volunteers photographed on Riverton Sandy Burr. And it turns out that bird came all the way from Chiloe Island off the west coast of Southern South America in Chile. So, you know, sometimes that stuff is super exciting. Uh, that's actually very interesting for the reason that I didn't realize that those red knots from the far Pacific side came through Manitoba. So it was, it was really great. I was going to ask Christian related to Linda's question. Yeah. Um, I know you can't, um, you, you don't know sort of what the habitat's looking like in Manitoba, but are there places in general you would suggest seeing shorebirds in high water years? Yeah, there's some like, like, so if you live in Winnipeg and you go to Okamek, you know, like go up Pipeline Road and Blackdale Road or go over to Highway 8, where, the, where Highway 8 meets 67. There's often standing water in those fields. Uh, you know, like I just always used to keep an eye on them. Sometimes beyond the north side of Okamek, like 84 north, and there's some roads going north from there. Uh, you know, there's standing water there. That's where... Um, uh, we had a, a Eurasian widgeon there and all that standing water one year, for example. Those areas are really good. Even in Winnipeg, like even um, around the dump in uh, uh, Brady Landfill and, and those roads that sort of lead up around the perimeter or behind the dump. Uh, and and uh, sometimes those have shorebird habitat. It all depends on year. It all depends if the water level corresponds to the shorebird migration so i always just just keep an eye on where there's a lot of snow or a lot of water now and try to predict what the melt is going to be like and try to go check those places uh you know i make a mental note of oh that's really wet right now oh that's flooded <laughs> probably the only person who's excited about standing water <laughs> is, is a shore <laughs> Is a shorebirder, and you better not say that too loud because some of the some of the farming folk might get up mad at you. But but I usually watch it, and um, of course in the west, you know, there's some there's some spots on the east side of Brandon, and the way down to Whitewater Lake, there's a couple of sloughs that, depending on things, will be good or or too deep. Whitewater, it 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 just sort of depends. Like if in some years the shorebirds will be in the standing water quite far from the lake in other years there'll be more on the lake shores depending on where things are at so um, i can't give anybody anything really specific this year because i just haven't been out there scouting scouting the the, the standing water but you can do that on your own it's kind of fun and you, know, you have to be very careful right now because there's so many roads are are flooded, you know, like might be just a very short section, but you can't go through. Yeah. I would, the, the bridge at La Barrier Park is, exactly. completely, it's gone. Yeah, it already had issues back in the day when I was there. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, no, Bertas never, Bert never get stuck. It's good. It was, <laughs> no, you can't, it's, the road is absolutely closed. There are no, yeah. guard, there are no guardrails left on that bridge at all. It's yeah. just, trees yep. and everything and then i went south from there and went west to go on to 75 and the road was closed due to floodwaters you couldn't yeah. get on to 75 so yeah. you really have to be careful you're going to have to do some backtracking yeah yeah good point fill your car with gas before you go <laughs> safety safety first and be prepared to turn around and backtrack and, and for the shorebirds often it's a bit closer it's not quite all the way to the barrier it's more around the dump itself and right some of those roads there. But again, it really all depends on the melt and things. And uh, sometimes there's almost artificial habitat where they pile up snow along Charleswood. And I mean, nowadays, Charleswood is so developed, uh, like um, like Caniston. And I, there used to be some good shorebirding right along Caniston. <laughs> but well, they, the snow, they pile the snow there and then it would melt out. And the Wilkes Sewage Lagoon, uh, not the sewage lagoon proper but the sort of area in front of the sewage lagoon would have shallow water like they even sometimes there used to be shore birding in the western side of the city i don't know if that it's so developed now i don't know if that exists anymore but but uh, 
But any, any, anywhere close to you where you notice standing water that looks deep now that might become just really shallow in the next two weeks, then it's worth, it's worth looking at it. Sometimes you, you find them uh, in great numbers. So, and, and as I said, if you can sit in a vehicle or if you've got a place where you can observe them, it's, it's wonderful learning and take that material with you. Um, take your, and, and I usually would advise people to use a spotting scope for shorebirds. It's, uh, uh, maybe it looks easy with, with big, large photos like this, but uh, the reality is that, uh, you know, you want a, a scope makes life much easier if you've got a spotting scope. So, as, uh, especially if you're at a place like Whitewater Lake where they can be quite far away. Uh, Dwayne's question was um, also, why would a bird have that many bands? As opposed oh. to just where do you report it? Yeah, um, yeah, it's got to do with, it's got to do with, um, it's got to do with the ease of sight and, and, uh, and marking, like I, a, a metal band with numbers is actually very hard to read, like you almost need to have a scope or very good photograph. So some of the researchers who want that information use an additional band. So they'll have a they'll have a number band, but they'll, they'll also have a flag. And the color of the flag will tell you where the bird comes from. So for example, if you see a red knot with a green flag, it was banded in Texas along the Gulf of Mexico, for example. Uh, so um, the, the researchers know what the colors mean and the other information. And usually that's the thing that you notice. Um, you see the flag and you're like, okay, I've got to try to read the band. Um, it, the band. If you're looking through a big flock of shorebirds and sometimes in Manitoba, you will see big flocks. Like we've seen flocks in, in uh, Whitewater Lake, uh, over 10,000 shorebirds, you know, in total of multiple species. So trying to look for a metal band in that in 10,000 <laughs> won't stand out, but the, but the leg flags will. So they, these are some of the reasons why um, I'm not really uh, a bander, so um, although I'm involved with the bird observatory, I've not really done that myself directly. So, might be Dwayne. You might want to ask uh, a shorebird researcher that question for a bit more in detail. But that's the general, that's the general principle, and you'll see it with other things like turkey vultures. If you see them with a, they'll have a tag on the wing, for example. There'll be the, there'll be some things that are readable at a great distance, uh, and the the leg flag is for that purpose. Okay, well, I think that wraps everything up then. Um, so thank you very much, Christian. Thank you everybody for joining us. This was our last webinar of the webinar series. So if you try to join us next Wednesday, <laughs> no one will be here. <laughs> But thank you so much. I know many of you came to multiple webinars and uh, I hope you uh, learned a lot about various bird species um, throughout these five weeks. Um, and I will send the link around when I send the recording and um, Christian's resources around. But we do have a number of IBA events coming up. Um, shorebird identification, the practical portion, as well as um, a trip to Whitewater Lake in southwestern Manitoba. So stay tuned for that, or you can check out our Manitoba IBA uh, website. And like I said, I'll send that around. So thank you, and thanks for the kind words to both myself and Christian. We uh, really appreciate it. Now, now you're going to make me jealous going to Whitewater Lake. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really miss it. There, there, there is not a lot of good shorebirding in the Ottawa vicinity, so... You just got to come back. <laughs> I really, I really miss that lake. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks so Thanks, much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Have, have a good evening. Bye all. Okay. Bye. Take care, everybody. <laughs>